That it starts really with uh, going to the to a school. Can you can you read here? You can. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So in Kerman, Iran, we had you know public schools like any other places, and then we have uh, schools which were run by. Uh, like in Kerman by the Zoroastrian Association of Kerman. And by the way, let me mention here for uh, our non-Zoroastrian uh, guests here that uh, traditionally anywhere in either Iran, India, Pakistan, Europe, today here in America, everywhere that Zoroastrians are, they have their association, like the one that we have here, but in those countries, like in Iran, in Pakistan, it's more than just an association of members. Uh, by law and by the government uh, rules and regulations, they also are responsible for the uh, personal affairs and religious affairs of the faith, whether it's the Rastrians, whether it's uh, uh, Christians, like in Iran, Christians or Jews. The associations have that, yeah. Have, have that special responsibilities. So in Kerman, the Russian Association had these schools which were run by the association and there were uh, quote unquote private schools, meaning that they would charge tuition to the students. However, this particular school, and I'm sure that other schools also, the most the majority of students were non-Zoroastrians. And many of them, Zoroastrians and non-Zoroastrians, would pay a minimal and sometimes no tuition. And in exchange for that, the government would provide the salary of the teachers. So that was the kind of relationship that I had. Now, one of other things that we had in Iran, and we still have, and it was before revolution also, which was religious teachings was part of the curriculum from grade one till 12. So it happened, it was like this, that in uh, the government schools, non-religious schools or schools run by the associations, Zoroastrians or other minority religions, uh, the only thing that they would teach would be uh, Islamic teaching, right? Non-Muslim students who would go to those schools would either do not go to those classes or whatever, if they do or whatever, but they had to bring some certificate of doing some sort of uh, uh, religious study in their own religion in order to get, quote unquote, grade for, for that course. Now, in, in the Zoroastrian schools, schools run by the Zoroastrians, so the religious class was obviously Zoroastrians, right? So I started my education in Zoroastrianism by going to that school from grade one. And throughout my education, <laughs> we had the fortunate of having uh, this uh, Mubed, which was also the teacher for, for the classes, for the religious classes. And not only we learned about the daily prayers and so forth, but he would talk about the culture, the ceremonies, the rituals, and also some verses from Gatha, some teachings from Gatha. Now, sir, in, in these classes, were Muslim and no. non Zoroastrian students no. exempt? Yes, they were exempt. yes, they were exempt. By the way, they, we did have the Islamic classes, Islamic religion classes, or that was it, not Christians and others. So we had, in our school, we had the Zoroastrian classes and we had the Muslim, Islamic classes. So, from that early, 
I heard these things from Gautha, which were talking about uh, freedom of choice, you know, the good and bad, how to make the decisions based on what is good, what is bad, and so on. Okay, it was very, very preliminary, but you know, it started to introduce me to these concepts. I was hearing that, oh, how, how good Zoroastrian is, and you know, how Zarathustra has said something new 3,000 years ago, but that's the only thing that I, I heard from them. So I had my Sedra Pushi, instead of having in a separate ceremony in a family or any big celebration, uh, I had my Sedra Pushi in my class with a couple of other fellow students. You know. So it was that kind of introduction to Zoroastrianism that I got there. And through the years, as I was getting more education and uh, going through the university, colleges, coming here, little by little, I developed this sort of understanding that teachings of Zarathustra is more than what we typically know. And I have been trying to, to find what is that it, it has attracted me, and you know, how can I uh, reconcile that with my background as a scientist, basically. Right? So that's why that my reading of the Gatha is more secular reading of, of, of the teachings of Zarathustra. And in that regard, I would say the reason that I think the Gatha studies here is a little bit different is because of that, that we think the group that we have started this, we think that like you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, it's not just one book that you read, the translation of the God Hall, and that's it, okay? We have been trying, and by the way, let me mention that, you yourself, Kersi Sharoff, and others were part of the team that we started the whole thing here, and we have been doing it in the last uh, four or five years now. So, that's why that in our studies, it's not a class, we are not teaching anything, but we are studying God has together. And in order to do that, we are doing comparative studies, comparative readings of the God has. Looking at different books, we look at exactly what are the terms which are used in God has, and uh, you know, how each translator has translated that word, and then each one of us will make our own decision that, okay, this makes sense to me, this doesn't make sense to me. And this is, by the way, uh, based on Zarathustra's own methodology in Gatha's. To me, being a Zarathustra means uh, following up or following up the teachings of Zarathustra. Like being a Muslim means that you are following the teachings of uh, Muhammad, right? And so on, okay? So that's the very first thing that I define myself as being Zarathustra. I try to follow the teachings of Zarathustra. So in order to do that, the question, the next question logically is that, uh, what are the teachings of Zarathustra? Where are they? And like you mentioned before, it happens that what is left to us and reaches us today from the teachings of Zarathustra from 300,000 years plus 
the goal is what we have in the collection, which is called Godhaus. All right? These are the parts that by almost all scholars are accepted as being the teachings of Zarathustra. So when you read through that one here, you see collecting knowledge and information about that subject, pondering upon what you have collected regarding the questions that you had or the issue that you have observed, and thinking with your good mind, and then making a decision which is based on something that Zarathustra uh, introduces us to that, which is uh, the concept of Asha. Asha meaning the cosmic order rule of the universal rule of the universe, everything in it. Humans, nature, all together. And that's the concept that uh, governs the progress of the universe to the perfection. Okay? And the, the decision that you make, based on my understanding of the teaching of Zarathustra, if helps that progress of the universe towards perfection, that's something which is called good. And if you make a decision that hinders that progress, that's not good. So in other words, also in the teachings of Zarathustra, he talks about these two concepts of uh, good and bad in everything. Actually, there is a uh, part in Gatha, in one verse, which is considered the fun fundamental, foundational uh, teachings of Zarathustra, which is where that Zarathustra teaches two very unique concepts. A, this concept of these two phenomena, good and bad, in everything. Is it, is it good and bad, or is it good and lack thereof? There we go. The next thing that you see in the teachings is that from that point on, Zarathustra, I haven't seen and I, by no means I am a scholar of the Gata. It's all my own self-reading of the Gata and talking with here and there, and so based on my understanding of the Gata, from that point on, Zarathustra in the Gata doesn't talk about bad, mm -hmm. all right? <clears throat> Everything that he says is about the good part of that. Mm -hmm. What is good? And obviously, when something is not good, that's bad. So that's, that's the main thing. And then part of that, to close the circle here, is that in the same verses that he has there, then he talks to the audience who has gathered to listen to him. You know, he says that, I'm, I'm, listen to me, I'm going to speak of something which nobody has talked about before. And then he talks about these two phenomena of good and bad in everything. In your thoughts, your deeds, your words, everything, right? And then he says that, listen to what I have to say. Each and every one of you, think about that, make your own decision, choose your way. That's what we call it today, freedom of choice. Even on this very basic, and this is something that, in my opinion, is unique. 3,000 years ago, and still applicable today, and the big issue today. 
So that's my understanding of the Gata and the meteorology. So what makes it Zoroastrian? Somebody who, like, who was, uh, Anna, I guess, was saying that, uh, you know, you don't make a judgment who is Zoroastrian or who is not. That's exactly what I believe in that. Anybody who professes or who says that he wants to, uh, he is a Zarathustra, that's fine. Who am I to say that you are or you are not? That's a personal decision that that person makes and says that, okay, I'm following the teachings of Zarathustra, whatever way that he has understood that. I don't have the monopoly on, you know, who should be a Zarathustra or not be a Zarathustra. Whoever that says, wants to be a Zarathustra is Zarathustra. Well, basically, you know, Sedra Pushi or Nojud is, again, one of those ceremonies that we have. Uh, I'm not that much fond of, you know, rituals and ceremonies and so forth, because, like I said, you know, the basic things for me is the way of life which is described, and I wanted to do that. However, I like that ceremony as a cultural event. And I look at it as uh, like uh, graduations or you know, initiations or things like that, which happens all over the world in different stages of your life. So I looked at that, that as like that, and I wanted to do it based on what I understand of the Gatha and the teachings and that. And so that's how we did it. We basically uh, first talked to my daughters to make sure that they want to do that. And once that they were convinced that they want to do that, then I started sort of teaching them gathas based on, again, my understanding of the gatha. And with uh, Sharzad, my wife, you know, we had these uh, small gatherings at home, the four of us, and we talked about these things here, the principles of the teachings of Zarathustra, and then we did it. We had a ceremony at our house, and uh, we had a few friends which were there. Oh, I talked to Mobed, uh, and I told him that I want to do it myself. And that's exactly what we did. There was no religious ceremony, special prayers, anything like that. There was no way of doing that. Uh, we talked about, you know, the importance of this and the teachings of Zarathustra and so forth. And then the kids themselves did their own Sedrapushi. They had practiced before, and they did that, and we talked that, and that was it. And I told them something specifically to them from you. Whatever that you're learning here today at this stage of your mind, of your life, is what we as a parent are telling you, and you are thinking about that, and you, you have decided, that, okay, this is what my parents tell me, I'm going to accept it. But remember, by no means, what you learn here is what is going to be the only thing. So 10 years from now, I hope that you follow up on these teachings. And at that time, if you realize that what I said today doesn't make any sense to you with new things that you have learned, come and tell me and correct me. That's what I want you to see on that. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here.